If you're wondering how Nearpod can be used in a math classroom, today I'm going to show you what that can look like. My name's Corey Henwood, and although many teachers use Nearpod's features to enhance their lectures and get feedback from students, which it's great at, by the way, I take quite a different approach. In my classroom, we use Nearpod every day to take on the big problems and collaborate on applications of the mathematical topics relevant to the courses that I teach. In this way, my class accesses a digital curriculum of rich application problems where collaboration is built in. Today I'm going to show you how we use Nearpod on a day when we worked about problems relating to trigonometric ratios as we discussed the Sacre Curve funicular. Although I might be tempted to start out by telling students that I used to live beside the Sacre Curve and went running to the top each morning only to ride the funicular down afterwards, I resist that temptation because as cool as that is, it's not nearly as engaging or mathematically relevant as this is. So I decide to show them the funicular. First, right off the bat, and not tell them about it, to try to draw their mathematical curiosity. In this way, I've introduced the task early on, and it's concise. There's only a few questions you can ask here. So I ask my students to write down the first question that comes to their mind. I'll show you what the student view looks like on this black iPad, and then what the teacher view looks like on the white iPad. Then I see all the responses right in front of me as they've sent them in. It's awesome, huh? You'll notice that with Nearpod, there's no opting out here. Students must send me a question or a notice, and I go and visit them for a little bit of encouragement. Like little Susie here. You don't get this kind of participation in real time any other way. Even if students are engaged, many, if they're unsure at all, will wait to hear from what the smart kid has to say first before writing down their own question or thought. Sometimes they'll do this after the task is already irrelevant. Maybe we've already decided on a focus question and they just copy it down. So now I share out the questions I got with the most insightful, relevant questions that I came in from the class. This empowers the kids in two real ways. One, they want their question to be picked and shared with the class, so I try to come up with the best one. And two, they feel like they're directing the class. When they're learning self-directed, answering their own questions, they're much more involved. Next, we ask them to find what would be just too long length for the track and what would be just too short, since that's the question we decided to go with. Then, it's up to me to share out which of these will provide the best discussion so we can crowdsource the pattern of people's thoughts in the class to make a pretty solid narrowing of our error bounds together. If you try to do this without Nearpod, you'll find that the students, especially the less confident ones, are influenced by their peers before entering their own thoughts. In this way, we reverse this so that the students share their voice, then reflect on the collaboration. That way, the collaboration doesn't squash their individual thought like it does in many other group settings. But instead, it makes you reflect on your own personal thoughts, which is what we want. So now we send a poll to the class. Once we're done, we'll share out the results, and the students now have a stake and a competition going to see what, who will be the closest to the answer. I share the poll with the class so they can see the results and whether there's consensus or not. Now I'm asking the students to help formulate the problem by asking for what information they need to solve for the length of the track. This is so cool because they determine what they need is relevant and which pieces are relevant, which ones aren't, and what they're going to do with that information. So I share out these ideas that I get in and we discuss which, what things you might be able to do with each piece of information and which ones aren't quite relevant at all. Many times this helps scaffold the task because students might not be able to come up with all the rel relevant information on their own. If they were in a group setting with a smart kid, they might not even contribute at all. They might just let Smarty, who knows all the relevant info, take the lead. This way in Nearpod they can contribute also and then benefit from the collaboration after they contribute. I just want to show you here that I can note which students are not on the app if they want to go and take a selfie or something and disengage. Disengage is not an option in my class, but it's a large temptation with a device like this in front of you, so it's important. Now I show the students the relevant information that they asked for. From this picture, they can determine the height of the opposite side by subtraction. With the greater slope of the hill given, they can determine the angle of elevation through inverse trigonometric functions, or they can use a proportional relationship to find the length of the adjacent side. So you can see how we have really climbed the ladder of abstraction here, leading up to the last couple of pieces and tasks. Students are now modeling the problem and then solving for the length of the track. 
they use the information that they just came up with um, from the Act 2 for the solution. Now sometimes I'll send students to Desmos graphing calculator through a web length or even to GeoGebra or others to show um, to, that they can model it well. If it's on the web, they don't need to leave the application. Send them right to it via Nearpod web link. Now I share out what people's solutions are, especially those that are incorrect. We can share anonymously if you haven't noticed yet. So this means that we can critique someone's work without making them feel shot down. We point out what's correct and incorrect about each one and then leave the true answer ambiguous if we want to send them back so they can touch up their work if they want. Students are now asked to write out their conclusion, what they think the answer will, will be and also if there's any possible sources of error. Again, we share this out for rich class discussion about sources of error and how the theoretical doesn't always match up with the practical. Finally, in Act 3, now we can prove that their math has worked. We show them in this video a view from the top of Montmartre to see if their answer would be reasonable about the length of the track. And finally, we show them the dimensions of the track. This always brings up some oohs and ahs and the simple calculation problems where the answers in the back of the book doesn't really compare. I can now access a report uh, generated to see all the inputs the students have. All in all, the application is an excellent solution for my math classroom. We've put together this digital curriculum that speaks to students, works in ways that engages them, empowers them as individuals while enhancing their learning through collaboration. Thanks and be sure to check out Henwood Math on Google.